to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be taking a look at some of the threats to ocean life. My guest is an expert on this topic. Liz Karen is the Project Director of Protecting Ocean Life on the High Seas. She works with the Pew Charitable Trust. Liz Karen, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me, Bill. Thank you. I appreciate being with you again. Let's, Liz, let's jump right into it. What is the Pew Charitable Trust? What is its main purpose? Sure. The Pew Charitable Trusts is a U.S.-based international organization. Uh, we work on a myriad of topics, not just the environment, also on uh, democracy and economic issues. But primarily, it has a large portfolio on environmental issues, uh, both terrestrial uh, and climate change. But I work uh, primarily on the oceans issue and a large portfolio on international fisheries and international conser ocean conservation. And our viewers can go to your website at www.pewtrust.org for more information. Why is, what is your program to protect ocean life on the high seas? So Pew has been engaged since 2012, uh, following the negotiations at the United Nations uh, to create a new treaty uh, for the conservation and protection of marine life beyond national jurisdiction, which would allow for the establishment of high seas protected areas. Um, so my program is focused on those negotiations and making sure that they are um, uh, result in a successful, uh, ambitious and robust treaty that we hope will be completed in early uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. There are two terms, two entities that are out there that are so important uh, we heard a lot about them several decades ago, but we haven't heard as much lately, and we really need to hear more about them. And one is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty, and the other is the International Seaboard uh, Seabed Authority. What, uh, briefly, what does each of those do? So the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea is also known as the Constitution for the Oceans. Um, it's probably best known for establishing that 200 nautical mile uh, limit for what is considered a, a nation's uh, ocean's territory. Beyond that is what's considered the high seas. And this new treaty that's being negotiated is um, to uh, develop conservation regulations uh, for those high seas areas. Uh, the International Seabed Authority is also a product of the uh, UN Convention on uh, Law of the Sea. Uh, and that is focused primarily on the uh, ensuring that any exploitation from deep seabed mining uh, outside of national jurisdictions uh, is done with the proper environmental regulations and controls so that marine biodiversity is not adversely affected. Now, as I recall, the United States Senate obviously has to ratify this convention. And this is one that came out in the 80s, as, if memory serves. Wait, it's been several decades ago. I'm just curious, this, this convention is so important and it affects basically every country in the world, especially the ones that front any type of ocean or sea or whatever it may be. What is the sticking point on this? I know the US military, the Navy is in favor of this, the business community is in favor of it. Uh, all the polls show that the majority of the American public's in favor of, but the U.S. Senate has not moved on this, or maybe they have, and I just didn't see it. Yeah, no, this has been a tricky uh, treaty for the U.S. Senate to ratify. Um, the exact provisions under contention, um, I believe, have to do uh, around um, uh, benefit sharing that does relate in part to this issue uh, at the International Seabed Authority. Um, but regardless of whether the US is, uh, has ratified the treaty or not, it actually is one of the countries that uh, implements it to the most fullest effect. Oh, okay. So we, we haven't signed off on it officially, but we're still incorporating provisions of it. The thing though is once they start the mining, uh, as I understand it, that the US will not be able to actively participate, will we? Because you have to be a signatory to the convention of the Law of the Sea Treaty to be part of that group. Is, is that right or is that incorrect? That is correct. And so um, what we've seen is that a lot of US-based companies are have actually put forward um, mining interests or mining applicate, provisional mining applications uh, or interests for, uh, to ex for exploitation mine, uh, of mining resources 
through their uh, overseas subsidiaries. When this convention, the Law of the Sea Treaty came online years ago, or was finally semi-adopted, shall we say, there was a lot of enthusiasm talking about manganese nodules and some of the ent well entities that could be extracted from the bottom of the sea. Today, we're living in a different world. So often now, we're talking about how can we mine anything and do it safely in an environmentally sound way. What What is the status of seabed mining at this point? Is Can it be done safely? Will it disrupt the coral reefs? Will it destroy fishes? Or where, where are we on this? And I guess it depends upon what type of mining you do, where you do it, how you do it, and that type of thing. Yeah. So the high seas and those areas beyond national jurisdiction and the deep seabed mining, uh, the deep seabed below the high seas, are one of the richest reservoirs of biodiversity on the planet. Uh, scientists are still discovering new species uh, and predict that there are many more that we have we don't even know about. So it is really um, a hotbed of life um, on Earth. Uh, so the challenge and uh, the concern about mining in the deep seas is that we don't know um, what we might be affecting uh, in those areas by undertaking this industrial level activity. Um, and those, a lot of these technologies are really still in the early phases and they haven't been tested. And we're talking about mining in areas, deep areas, uh, you know, up to, you know, sometimes over a mile beneath the ocean um, that is, you know, are really hard to get to. Uh, and so if you think about the, the challenges that we've seen with terrestrial mining, mining on land and the environmental impacts that, uh, the negative environmental impacts that, uh, and consequences from that, uh, we don't want to see that replicated in the ocean. And so uh, you know, the International Seabed Authority has a responsibility and the, mem the states that are a party to that have a responsibility to ensure that no mining takes place until we're certain that we know, um, you know what those impacts will be and how they can be mitigated. Mm -hmm. That is so important. We have to know what the devastation is going to be or if there is devastation, how we can avoid it. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps you are with an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a podcast or you have a computer and you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at the protection of the oceans and how important that is. And my guest is an expert on this topic. Liz Karen is the project director of Protecting Ocean Life on the High Seas with a few charitable trusts. Liz, we're talking about the uh, International Seabed Authority and that uh, the Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, recently, there was a major international conference in Kingston, Jamaica on the International Seabed Authority. What, what transpired at that? So there they were talking, uh, states convened uh, to discuss the regulations, uh, basically what happened uh, about two years, 18 months ago, uh, the, uh, one of the contractors um, uh, put forward an intent to mine, which really accelerated the process for um, figuring out how uh, to ensure that the regulations are in place. Um, basically, uh, if there are no regulations in place, um, this mining activity could start in the deep sea as early as uh, mid 2023. So the International Seabed Authority is trying to fast track this process of developing environmental regulations, which shouldn't be fast tracked. It should be done properly and making sure that there's enough uh, scientific information that's gathered and, and um, oversight that's necessary to ensure that um, no environmental uh, damage is, occurs from these activities. Um, and states are waking up to this. Uh, at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in June, uh, high-level representatives uh, from Fiji, 
Confederated States of Micronesia and other countries came forward to say that they felt very, very concerned about this prospect of deep seabed mining occurring. Um, those are small island states, but also considered big ocean states. So they really understand the connectivity of the oceans and land and the important um, resources that the ocean has for um, livelihoods, food security, um, and are deeply concerned about the potential of these activities coming forward. Uh, more recently, New Zealand and Germany, amongst others, have also come forward. Uh, Chile and, uh, and uh, Costa Rica calling for a pause or precautionary pause of these activities uh, in, until these regulations um, can be done uh, with, uh, properly. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the UNFCCC, the climate conference uh, that happened uh, just recently, um, President Macron of France called for an outright ban of deep sea bed mining activities. So this has become a really um, hotbed issue right now with the prospect of mining happening uh, just you know months away. Uh, and, uh, and nobody really, and I think people are waking up to the fact that they don't wanna see this terrible um, activity happening unless we have, again, those proper, that proper oversight and regulations um, and making sure that the International Seabed Authority does not um, uh, try to fast track these, uh, um, these regulations um, and does uh, the proper science necessary. Exactly. The, you, we have to have proper oversight or we could actually destroy our oceans the way we've destroyed our land in many areas of the world. So this is exactly, it's very critical. Do you ever see a situation where the countries won't come to some agreement and you'll just have mining companies going out beyond the 200 mile uh, economic zone off the maritime countries or whatever, and just setting up mining operations and sort of have a wild west philosophy, well, I sink a well wherever I want to, or mine manganese nodules or whatever, and do it with no oversight. And just if I destroy the environment, kill the fishes, destroy the coral reefs and the planet, why worry about it? Do you ever see something like that happening? Well, I think we're increasingly seeing more activities happening um, in the high seas. There are um, or plans for it, you know, with, with the, the threat of climate change and the need to um, do something about that. There are um, ideas and plans, geoengineering projects, carbon, you know, to sequester carbon um, and potentially pump it into the oceans. Um, and there is a real concern about that. And that's why this, this other treaty process um, for the, uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier for the protecting marine diversity on the high seas is really important. Um, not only would it allow for states to establish high seas marine protected area to ensure the comprehensive protection of biodiversity and marine life in an area in important areas, it would also um, have provisions for environmental impact assessments. So any new activities, whether there's an international body or not to regulate it, um, would any any activity, new activity proposed in the high seas would have to um, conduct a robust environmental impact assessment that could be reviewed by a global body um, to ensure that those negative impacts on the environment um, either weren't anticipated, wouldn't take place, or that were properly accounted for and there were mitigation strategies in place before that activity um, could go forward. Now, the UN has done its part to a large degree as far as bringing the parties together, providing technical assistance to help with the conferences, developing the machinery, the statutory machinery for these conventions and what have you. But it's really up to the individual states, the countries, really to become signatories of this convention, to sign on to it, and to help adopt some very stringent regulations so that we can do it safely and environmentally sound and not really overwhelm the, the oceans or help destroy our planet. What do, you, what do you see as the next steps? What should be done next to help bring everyone together to uh, come to a common conclusion and move forward together? Yeah, well, we have a number of different opportunities um, coming up. Uh, there's the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is meeting in Montreal next, uh, next month. We'll develop a global bio, biodiversity framework for states. Um, and that um, one of the targets that they're negotiating there is to protect 30% of land and sea by 2030. And I think there's a lot of momentum around that target. We hope it will be adopted. Um, as part of the biodiversity framework, 
And that really sets the backbone for recognizing that we need to set aside the planet, a good chunk of the planet for conservation if we're going to maintain a sustainable environment, sustainable oceans, land, um, and sea for us all uh, to be able to survive and continue to benefit from um, you know, the ecosystem services and the food security benefits that we uh, derive from, from our planet. Um, after that, in early spring, we're expecting these negotiations for the Marine Biodiversity Treaty, which we call uh, BB&J affectionately in the UN. Um, and uh, you know, we hope that that will be completed. It's, it's uh, on track uh, to be finalized in the spring. Uh, and that, again, that would allow for the creation of protected areas in the high seas, as well as this process for environmental impact assessments. And then in, I think countries then have a real uh, test uh, coming up in July of next year to figure out what to do at the International Seabed Authority uh, to ensure that that mining activity won't go forward um, without these proper environmental safeguards. Now, is the the bulk of the ocean? I think planet seventy five percent of the planet's water or oceans and seas, that type of thing. If you're more than 200 miles out, is that considered now a country, say Argentina or the United States or whatever, they could go out 200 miles. They have control over that continental shelf and over the, the waters up to 200 miles. But beyond that, is that still considered the common common good, the common a common resource that's for the use of all people on the planet? Yeah, and I think that's uh, exactly right. And uh, those common areas, those uh, high seas, uh, global commons, uh, make up two thirds of the world's oceans. So um, it's still, it's a significant part of our blue planet. Um, and, you know, they make up, you know, they play a very important role in our carbon cycle, our oxygen cycle. Um, you know, they say, scientists say that every second breath you take, you can thank the oceans for, um, for recycling that carbon into uh, breathable air. Um, so it's a really significant portion uh, of our planet. And there are, um, you know, regional sectoral bodies, uh, fisheries bodies that do manage different slices of the ocean, different slices of industrial activity in the ocean. Um, but what the real benefit and of this high seas treaty uh, that's being negotiated uh, next spring is a way to uh, put a comp uh, comprehensive conservation lens on this, uh, on the issues there, and think about the environment, putting the environment first. Um, I think with with the threat of climate change uh, hanging over all of us, uh, you know, and the important ocean, uh, important role that oceans play in in our climate cycle, and regulating our climate, uh, as well as providing, uh, uh, you know, this treaty has an opportunity to ensure that that the oceans are climate resilient, uh, and and more now, now more than ever, we really need that. We all have a stake in preserving the ocean, the health of the oceans. We have to do it because if not, we're going to be adversely affected. Afghanistan, Paraguay, there are many landlocked countries. What role do they play? They're not confronting on any seas or oceans, but what role do they play as far as participating perhaps in the revenue produced by mining or by setting the rules and regulations? Yeah, well, landlocked countries are, have definitely been at the table and very active players in the negotiations. Um, you, know, I, uh, you know, whether they're big economies, big industrial states that are uh, have actors in these areas, or, you know, as a delegate from Nepal once said to me, uh, the, the snow that they have in the Himalayas came from the oceans. And that snow melts and provides freshwater resources um, for all the people in their country. Um, and that and, and the water brings them life. Um, and so uh, whether you're landlocked or a coastal state, uh, the oceans are important to you. Um, they do provide livelihood. And, uh, and I think countries recognize uh, re that importance and are actively engaged in the negotiations um, as a result. Mm -hmm. That's very important. How did the, and I guess it's an obvious question, what is the state of the health of the oceans today? We've read for decades about how the fishes are being over, well, they're being overfished, uh, to be quite honest. We see that aquaculture is going to play a much larger role in providing fish supplies in the future. We're reading more about the, uh, oh, the, the floating plastic islands, what have you, the gyres, I think that's what they're called. 
in in the where the curves come together there's some estimate that within the next 10 15 20 years that uh, there'll be more plastic in the ocean there will be fish weight wise so what what is the state of the health of the oceans right now yeah, no, that's a great question, Bill. And, and you've mentioned so many threats that the oceans are facing. For too long, I think uh, people have seen the oceans as a bountiful resource and one that could absorb anything that we put into it. Um, and what we're seeing now, what the science is showing us, um, you know, especially in recent years, one study after another, um, that the oceans are reaching their tipping point. Um, they're reaching their brink. Um, we are facing all these threats. They are, um, you know, they are not rebounding as. Uh, um, or, or you know they they can't uh, suffer uh, ongoing this ongoing level of extraction um, without um, without breaking and then you add to it the the issue of climate change that are uh, changing the very chemistry of the oceans making the waters warmer more acidic less habitable for the fish life the marine life that depend on it um, and the fish that feed us as well I think the hope here uh, the hopeful story here is that. Um, the oceans can also rebound, right? If we take care of the oceans, if we don't, you know, if we uh, manage them well, um, that even under different climate scenarios, you know, we can still ca hopefully count on healthy oceans, but it does require taking action, it does require setting up, um, you know, ensuring that at least 30% of our oceans are protected, that those areas are also in the high seas um, where, um, that, that are a little bit beyond uh, some of the more uh, immediate impacts of pollution, but are still really important res reservoirs um, of marine life and biodiversity. They certainly are. Well, Liz, in our last 30 seconds or so, what is your final message to help us become more motivated to learn more about the Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty, the International Seabed Authority, and everything else that we need to learn about to help preserve, preserve our oceans? because we, our lives may depend upon their lives, to be quite honest, the seas and the oceans. Yeah, I think, you know, it's really, uh, these are separate processes, but they're all taking place by this, uh, and under, uh, being negotiated by the same government. So it's really reaching out to your government officials and saying uh, how much important these issues are to you, um, that, you know, oceans and climate, um, these extractive uh, activities need to be regulated. Um, and that we really need to start thinking more holistically about our planet if we're going to preserve it for future generations. That is exactly what we have to do. Well, Liz, Karen, it's an extremely important topic, and I'm so glad that you're involved, along with a lot of other people, in working on it because we have to maintain the ocean's good health or we will be adversely affected. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate you having me on. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.